way, let's do it. Well, that was the long version of the opener. That's a piece of a track that I did a long time ago called Hot Second Chakra, which uh, if you're interested, I'll send you the full version. It was a time in my life where I was sexually frustrated. I was doing all these tracks about sexuality and dance beats. <laughs> it was... It was kind of a fun, strange, uh, interesting, and therapeutic time. What's going on out there, everybody? This is Robert Phoenix broadcast to you live from the center of Texas, where it's going to be another beautiful day with real clouds. We've had a smattering of chemtrails, like the whiskers of cats showing up across the sky. Somebody asked me, uh, that was Lynette, she wanted to know what my cat's name was. He got on the live stream last night. And decided to, well, do what he does, you know, kind of steal the show. He's a great cat. He's a great uh, golden tabby named Jasper. And he's got a really interesting story. He was a, basically a rescue cat. He belonged to a street guy, a street person. And uh, he couldn't keep him any longer when he was a little kitten. So he took him to the shelter. And uh, he wound up living with... My ex-wife and my son. In fact, both cats were living with my ex-wife and my son. And she winds up meeting a guy who's allergic to cats. So where are the cats going to go? Well, the cats came with me because I wanted my son to still have a connection with these cats. That's, that's what parents do, I suppose. Anyway, that's his story. And I'm sticking to it. What's going on out there? It's not quite the 4th of July, but things are heating up. Trump Trump is uh, obsessed with CNN. I was going to do this on the live stream last night. There are so many par there are so many connections with the CNN chart and Trump's chart that it's it's crazy. I won't get into him today, but um, it, you it, you have your mind blown. CNN is a Gemini uh, company. Started uh, let me get to the date right here. It was started on June 1st, 1980. Sun in Gemini at uh, 10 degrees, Moon in Capricorn. Mercury in Cancer, 0 degrees, Venus in Cancer. So remember, Trump Scott, Saturn, Venus, Mercury in Cancer. Mars in Virgo. What is Trump's ascendant? It is 26 degrees, Leo. Am I right about that? No, it's 28 degrees Leo. 28 degrees Leo. And uh, so Mars would be in his first house. CNN's Mars would be in his first house. It would be about battle and conflict. Also, Jupiter is right there at 2 degrees in Virgo, right on Trump's ascendant. And Saturn in Virgo, also in Trump's ascendant. So three of the main planets that are connected to the first day that CNN took to the airwaves are in Trump's first house. What does that mean? Well, he takes it personally with the first house, personally. Now, CNN has Neptune, check this out, Neptune in Sagittarius. And it's at 21 degrees. So Saturn, transiting Saturn, is right on CNN's natal Neptune at 21 degrees. I wish I'd had more time and a little more energy for last night's show. It was kind of fading a little bit. But clearly, hello, Saturn getting right on top of Neptune, kind of, you know, putting the screws to to the, how do we say this, the, uh, the, the, the flimsy reality of Neptune in CNN's chart, in Sagittarius, and it's retrograde, retrograde. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens with CNN, with this Saturn, because it's not quite there yet. Saturn's at 23 degrees. It does go back to 21. Jeff Sucker might lose his job. 
I haven't looked at his chart yet. He might lose his job, though. Uh, the true node in CNN's chart is at 22 degrees. It is like conjunct Trump's ascendant. So he has this personal fixation. It is really personal from CNN's true node to CNN's Saturn to CNN's Mars to CNN's Jupiter, uh, all congregating really close to Trump's ascendant in first house. It is a personal, personal vendetta for Donald Trump. And... Uh, perhaps a bit obsessive. Perhaps a bit obsessive. More than just a bit obsessive. Uh, to the point where it's becoming sort of slightly imbalanced. And this could be used against Trump as we approach the Great American Eclipse on the 21st of August. And there is a move afoot in the Congress to try to remove Trump vis a vis the 25th Amendment which is if the president is proven to be mentally or physically incapable of serving, then he can be summarily removed from office. Now, the vice president must agree to the uh, statutes of the 25th Amendment and the procedures. Now, Pence, who would be a disaster, if you think Trump is a disaster, uh, Mr. Pence uh, would be... Mr. Pence would just join in lockstep with, with whatever our dear friends in the Middle East would want him to do because that's what's being told to do. He is a dyed-in-the-wool Zionist. Now, people think Trump is a dyed-in-the-wool Zionist. I think Trump is an opportunist, and that's really the bottom line, which is why a long time ago I said you can't trust him. Even his best associates can't trust him, part of which is because he's an opportunist, and the other part is because he has that sudden Uranus conjunction in Gemini. With the true note in Gemini, he's unpredictable. Mike Pence is not like that. Mike Pence is somebody who will basically follow orders. Now, the thing with Pence is that he is trying to figure out if he can get through this. Because if he can get through this and get through the next, <laughs> it's a long shot, eight years, if Trump can get reelected, which at this point doesn't look like it's going to happen. But if he could do that, then what Pence is essentially doing is he's setting himself up for his own eight-year run. So he's, he's weighing the options. And I'm not sure how loyal Mike Pence is. I think Mike Pence is loyal to Mike Pence, just, just about like everybody else in Washington. Okay, we're going to get into Illinois today. It's a pretty troubling situation. And um, I'm just going to read you a, a kind of a, a sound bite from your newswire, uh, yournewswire.com. And um, let's see what we have. What is this? Um, this is your newswire. Bankrupt Illinois to be broken up and dissolved into neighbor states. Okay, so to understand this, and we're gonna I'm gonna try to keep this at a at a reasonable clip today so that you guys can get as much information in, and I know a lot of you are at home, uh, and you're probably getting ready for the big day tomorrow, right? Independence Day. So I want to keep it kind of brisk and as sharp and clean as possible. Bankrupt Illinois to be broken up and dissolved into neighbor states. This is from your Newswire. And I'm going to use some terminology here. Uh, the liberal, because obviously they're coming from a... a, a a certain perspective, and Illinois is a liberal state. I don't think I'm saying anything here that's blasphemic. The liberal state of Illinois is grappling with a full-fledged financial crisis, and the only answer is to declare bankruptcy, break up the state, and dissolve it into neighboring states, according to the Chicago Tribune. Facing billions in unpaid bills and pension obligations, the state is hitting a cash crunch that is rare, even by liberal Illinois standards. Governor Bruce Rauner Warning the state has entered banana republic territory. Wow. So, a uh, longtime listener and, and uh, friend of the show, uh, Justin, sent me some facts around this because he's from Illinois. He's now moving, he now lives in Colorado, which is quite prosperous thanks to obviously uh, its biggest cash crop, but also their business is moving to Colorado and Denver is exploding. Denver is booming. 
So he, uh, he, he shared with me some of this uh, information around Illinois. But one of the things he shared was that they have suspended the lottery because if somebody wins the lottery, they can't pay it out. There's no money left in Illinois. And they're dealing with a president that is not going to bail them out. If Barack Obama, who had his ascendant, his ascendancy in Illinois, was still in office, he'd probably bail them out. Although, maybe not, because perhaps... This is part of a larger plan, which I'll get into. We're like a banana republic, Rauner said earlier this month after the General Assembly failed for the umpteenth time to pass a budget package by the regular session deadline. We can't manage our money. But the problems are years in the making, caused in large part by the state's long-term liberal policies, which led Moody's Investor Services to downgrade Illinois' credit rating to the lowest of any state. Illinois is like Venezuela now, a physically broken state that has lost its will to live, according to the Chicago Tribune. But before we run out of essentials, let's finally admit that after decade upon decade of taxing and spending and borrowing, Illinois has finally run out of other people's money. Now this is where the Chicago Tribune comes in and offers up the prescription for making things better in Illinois. No, it's not gutting services. No, it's not taking on austerity. No, it's not trying to figure out how to manufacture or bootstrap their way out of their financial crisis. It's about breaking up the state. The best thing to do is to break Illinois into pieces right now. Just wipe us off the map. Cut us out of America's heartland. Don't let the neighboring states carve us up and take the best chunks for themselves. The group that will scream the loudest is the state's political class who did this to us, and the big bond creditors who are whispering uh, talk of bankruptcy and asking forfeiture to save their own skins. And now, obviously, this is a bit tongue in cheek, but they're not the only. This is not the only source that has been talking about this. Uh, since our neighboring states are doing better, taking Illinois jobs and businesses and Illinois workers and taxing families, they might as well. Just take the rest of Illinois, too. Wisconsin can have Chicago and begin calling it South Milwaukee. I don't think Chicago would be called South Milwaukee. Reports have suggested the state could be the first to attempt to declare Chapter 9 bankruptcy. But under the law, that's impossible unless Congress gets involved. U.S. Senators Dick Durbin and Tammy Duckworth, both Democrats from Illinois, have so far refused requests for comment on whether they would consider getting involved Introducing a measure allowing state bankruptcy, Illinois is the fiscal model of what not to do, Representative Peter Roskam, Republican Illinois, told Fox News. While not commenting on the bankruptcy question, this avoids the behavior toward dealing with our challenges is what leads to the devastating impacts we are seeing today. So Illinois is in a precarious situation when the governor says that it is a banana republic and it is close to Venezuela. Uh, this is pretty concerning. And this is where we have, what is it, Chicago is the third largest city in the United States. Now, obviously, it might be a bit of a stretch to have Illinois broken up, but it is not inconceivable. It can be absorbed by parts of Kentucky, Indiana, Iowa, Wisconsin, and Missouri. There are There is talk. There is certainly talk that this uh, is within the realm of possibility. And if you look at it from the larger picture, there's something happening in the United States as it comes to bioregionality, as it comes to money, as it comes to uh, how a state wants to be able to source its geopolitical resources and, and agreements with other states. I mean, we can, we've been watching California just essentially remove any kind of ties to states that have any remote, remotely differing political viewpoints and opinions than California. Like, California has a travel ban. It will not support travel as a state to about eight or nine states, including the one that I'm speaking to you from, which is Texas. So what we're seeing is both this sense of being this dispersing and, and, and enclaving at the same time, California is becoming an enclave. Uh, Texas has always been an enclave to, uh, to a lesser degree, uh, in, you know, just by its nature and by 
its constitutional agreement, the state of Texas is able to renew its relationship with the Republic every year. It's rubber stamped, but there are uh, there are triggers inside of that agreement that theoretically could allow Texas to secede easier and faster than any other state. Now, I believe it, if it does, it would have to go into separate regions or have to go into its own kind of separate states within the state of Texas. But we're, we're very close to some of these realities being uh, surfacing and manifesting as this crisis of debt, number one, a crisis of what I would call spiritual faith, number two, and a crisis in terms of what it is to be a country, you know, to have a sense of national identity. Now, Obama was speaking out against national identity. In of all places, of course, Indonesia. You know, Obama is being very cagey. He's like, he's not spending a lot of time in the U.S., and if he is, it is incredibly stealth. I think Obama might be concerned that somebody could lay some papers on him. He might he might uh, wind up being called in you know, for an investigation, subpoenaed, whatever. But he's spending a lot of time abroad. Anyway, he was talking about how we have to retain sort of the talking points, the progressive talking points, and uh, keep this frothing, foaming sense of nationalism out of the public debate discourse. There's no other president in history who has done what Obama's done. For all of Bill Clinton's sort of post-presidential shenanigans, whatever they are, getting involved. So if you don't know this story, one of the reasons why Hillary Clinton lost in the first election, meaning she lost in the run-up to the election with Obama, as part of the primaries, uh, is that Bill did a deal with China on his own. I think it was about a six or seven million dollar deal, or fifteen million. It was it wasn't a ton of money. It wasn't like it was one hundred fifty million dollars. It was a relatively, in their world, small amount. But he did not cut certain people in, and as part of the punishment, Hillary was going to lose the election. And I think they were willing to go forward with Hillary or, or Obama at that point in time. It didn't matter if we would get our first black president or our first woman president. It was, it was going to be the first something. And the agenda would have been rolled out accordingly. Now, of course, with Obama, we had roughly about three and a half to four years of racial strife and division, which he did very little to calm down and promote more of a sense of unity. And instead, he would take meetings with Black Lives Matter in the White House again and again and again and again and again. Those meetings aren't happening now. So what we're dealing with is this fomentation of a, of a real crisis. And um, I'm not sure if how we're going to navigate through this because really in order for us to to get to get through it, we're going to have to stand together. You're kind of as one, and that's not happening. It's not going to happen anytime soon. So we're in a process of deconstruction. You know, the uh, one of the laws of thermodynamics is entropy, right? I forget what law it is, but entropy. Where everything moves towards a collapse. Everything moves towards a state of uh, decay. And out of that decay, you get chaos, and then you get this sort of void and reset, and then, of course, there's momentum in building something new. This is this is what happens all the time. It happens to empires. It happens to sports teams. You know, if you're good in your life, you can extend that entropy for a while, depending upon what your job is and or what your profession is. You know, if you're on your own, like myself, you're always dealing with trying to keep momentum up so you don't fall prey to the forces of entropy. That's a, it's a big... It's a big deal for people that work for themselves, for people that are engaged in this, to some extent, theater, right? Theater of consciousness, theater of the mind, theater of perception. So, anyway, we're at a point now where this entropic decay is is, is upon us. It's upon us. Now, can we redirect the energy, you know, like a, like a great Tai Chi master? Can we all be Tai Chi masters and just redirect that energy and push it off the coast and send it to China? <laughs> I don't I don't know. I don't think so. 
Um, although it's not out of the question. It is, you know, it is not out of the question. Americans and people in general are capable of amazing things. We're capable of miracles and we're capable of magic. But the, the cord that binds both of them is faith. And that is dwindling away to a large extent. I was looking at some statistics around uh, Christianity and atheism. And we're, we're moving more and more towards a secular country. More and more towards a secular world. With the exception of Islam, which is, which is this kind of psychic backlash of the secularity. It's a, it's a fascinating dynamic between this movement away from Christianity and the rise of, of Islam. And there's a reason for it. We've gotten into this before. But there's a significant reason for it because, because Wahhabist Salafist Islam is the most perfect method of control for the state. It's perfect. It is a perfect method of control because it is an extreme version of morality and, and as a theocratic state which is Saudi Arabia is, as a theocratic state, the two branches of the government are basically one branch of the government. One is the secular branch, which is the House of Saud, and the other is the religious branch, which is the Salafist Wahhabis, but they work together towards the same end and goal, which is what uh, Ibn al-Wahhab, who was the founder of Wahhabist uh, Islam a long, long time ago, that was his deal with the House of Saud in the beginning, so we're at a really interesting crossroads as we come to America's birthday just one day from tomorrow, or one day from today, I mean, tomorrow, the 4th of July. On the live stream last night, I got in some interesting material as it relates to uh, Julian Assange and, and just the chart of the United States in general, especially with uh, Neptune on the midheaven, the United States midheaven at uh, 23 degrees, was it 23 degrees, the Virgo. And what's going on with that midheaven, and what it what it means, and what it represents, and uh, how how it manifests as this kind of synthetic uh, version of our morality in a lot of ways. Anyway, uh, you could check out the the live show or the the live stream last night over on YouTube. And I think we got it together. I think we had the right elements. The right audio, everything kind of worked and clicked. And by the way, I apologize for Friday's audio with uh, Steve, Steve Creamy, who was fantastic as usual. Um, we're going to get that audio piece down so that the next time he comes on the show, you're going to hear all of his ideas and everything he has to say brilliantly, clearly, and articulately coming right out of his mouth. So that's my promise to you and my promise to Steve. We're going to get it right next time. And that's really about it for today. There's a lot going on, and as always, there's a lot going on. Um, and the other thing I wanted to talk about before I jump off here, and I'm going to try to bring more of this into our daily discussion, is how what's happening to Illinois relates to Agenda 21 and Agenda 2030. In fact, why don't I just do that right now for about the next five to ten minutes? Because it's in the, uh, it's in the header, it's in the, uh, in the tags. So what we're seeing here, with Illinois. Illinois is, if you go back to the 1960s, there, there were the two infamous professors, Cloward and Piven, who used welfare against the state, against the state of New York. They weaponized welfare. It was, it was called the Cloward-Piven strategy. I've written about it uh, on my website. You can actually go to my website and read both the astrological and the sociological breakdown of Clara Piven. And essentially what they did is they said, hey, look, in order to break this political hegemony, i.e. the state, we're, they, now we have welfare in place, thanks to Lyndon Baines Johnson and the Great Society, we're going to weaponize it, and we're going to overload the state, and we're going to break the state. And they did. They broke New York State. They brought New York State as about as close as it gets to bankruptcy. They didn't go bankrupt, not like Illinois is about to go bankrupt, but they got it. They got it right to the edge. And as a result of that, they were able to initiate their own version of social programs and basically create a chaotic environment in which government could no longer sustain 
the efforts that it that it was set up to do. They couldn't clean the streets. Garbage was everywhere. There were strikes. It was really kind of this all-out psyop against the state of New York. And as a result, they wound up having an even more liberal government in the state of New York, both at a city level and at a state level, of course, until Rudy Giuliani came in. And Giuliani, who's, uh, I'm no fan of Rudy Giuliani because he knows where all the bodies are buried in 9-11 and what happened. But Giuliani became the tough guy and he cleaned everything up and he brought in those guys from Massachusetts who were the authors of the whole broken window manifesto, which uh, actually cleaned up a lot of stuff. It took, I mean, Rudy Giuliani, whether you like him or not, uh, it, he basically took New York and transformed New York and made it into a livable city because in the 1970s, New York was not livable. Some people will say, oh, well, there was, you know, there was punk rock and there was, there was the Bowery and the Lower East Side, and man, it was so real. You know? But you had to step over people. Like I remember one time I was at Port Authority, and this was in 1985, and New York was just starting to kind of turn that corner. But I was, I was at Port Authority. I was getting on a bus. I had to step over some guy who was like passed out in, in, in the Port Authority. Another guy was being attended to by the cops. It was, New York was not a pretty place back then. I mean, you know, if you were into the CBGB and punk rock, and hey, I guess you could, you know, have some fun there. You, I mean, you can still have fun here. Don't get me wrong. Right? But uh, anyway... Giuliani turned the corner. I'm not a fan, but he made New York livable for New Yorkers. So you've got to tip your cap, cap to that guy, no matter you know what kind of a... What's the word? Quisling. I think he's a quisling. Giuliani is. But anyway, what they did with Illinois was the same thing that they did with New York. They employed this strategy. They broke the system. They broke the system. Um, and there's various versions of breaking the system. Look at what happened in Detroit. They broke Detroit. Detroit became another version, a smaller version, albeit, of Illinois, but they broke it. They broke it through the stranglehold of the unions. They broke it through all kinds of um, uh, pieces of legislation that would make it more difficult for businesses to set up there. They had all kinds of regulations that we can't do this, we can't do this. Well, screw it. We'll just go somewhere else. This is what happened with Michigan and Detroit in general. I mean, uh, Flint is another version of that. Basically, people, you know, these businesses had to leave because they were making it impossible to do business in Detroit, in Michigan in general. So what did they do? They bankrupted Detroit. They bankrupted Flint. And all the property values went down. And then the Agenda 21, the Agenda 2030 comes into play, the Smart Cities Act, and you're going to see all this money getting pumped into Detroit. The people who are going to benefit the most, right, are the people who are the developers who are buying Detroit real estate, pennies on the dollar, absolute pennies on the dollar. They did the same thing with New Orleans post-Katrina. All those people had to move out of those wars, and they came in, and they bought all that real estate, pennies on the dollar. But they're still in the process of breaking New Orleans. You know, everything has to be broken. Everything theoretically has to enter into the state of entropic decay so that it can be remade. Ordo ab chow. Right, order out of chaos, and we are in the midst of chaos. We're in the flames of chaos. When you get a state like Illinois, which is a really important state, it's Chicago. It is the heartland, and it is about to implode. Things are. It's not business as usual. And the whole. If you're going to remake the United States into regions, into bioregions, into the mega cities, into the smart cities which is what Agenda 21 and Agenda 2030 are all about, you got to take down the existing structure. And you take it down economically, you take it down sociopolitically, you divide and conquer the people, you break apart families, you break apart marriages. Um, I was watching uh, YouTube this morning, the number of divorces and the types of divorces after the election were unprecedented. People were getting divorced because... One member of the family voted for Trump. Another member of the family voted for Hillary. And this is this is this is what happened. So we're in a really interesting time. Now again, this isn't all bad. It's not all bad because it, when there's chaos, some interesting things can happen. But you need to know how to roll with chaos. 
We have Uranus and Aries. and It'll be in Aries for roughly another year. It's going to have a brief foray into Taurus, and Aries is the individual, and Uranus is chaos and change. So it's in your chart, wherever it's in your chart, it's in your chart. Figure out where Uranus is in your chart. That's where you can begin to roll with chaos. And there's, you know, and this is what these people understand, right? There's magic in chaos because you got people looking in this direction, there's sleight of hand, press agitation, so there's magic in chaos. And this is what's happened with Agenda 21 and Agenda 2030. We're looking over here, we're looking over there, we're looking at what Trump is saying, what Trump is tweeting, the war with CNN, you know, so, so this is this is what's going on, the travel ban, and meanwhile, Agenda 21 and 2030, the silent creep. Silent creep, look over here, don't look over here. Watch what the right hand does, because the left hand is doing something very, very different. So they understand this, that out of chaos there's magic, and the magic for them is to transform the world, to transform the world into their vision, Whatever drives their vision, I'm sure there are people in the Agenda 2030 world who really think it's the great, the greatest thing, right? It's just like this is a, this is our our version of utopia. This is our holy grail. So we have to work for this. I'm going to have this guy, Grindel. I'm going to have him on the show because he's he's I think he's from Southern California. I think he's from West Covina. He's been putting up these Agenda 21 and 2030 videos, and he's very sharp. So he knows the stuff inside out. I want to get him on the show and talk with him um, and ask him about what he's seen. Because it's um, some of the footage is incredible. You know, like there's one meeting, there's one of these meetings where they have this guy who's leading this kind of new age band and this new age sort of moment of meditation and centering it's kind of, it's like if you're like if you're just there for the beating to like talk about public policy and you get this sort of new age high priest who's leading this band you know welcoming the divine invisible beings I mean you're scratching your head and I get it I understand like these people are very intentional about what they're doing and a lot of them are very it's their own belief right it's their own faith that that is fueling a lot of this. But then there are other people inside the Agenda 21, 2030 movement, especially at a high level, who are diabolical. And they know that they're selling us a bill of goods. And it's not about their uh, moral fixation about creating a better, just, more sustainable world at all. It's about the reallocation of resources so that those at the top will have a lot more of them than those at the middle and the bottom. And it's the ultimate con game. It's the ultimate uh, bait and switch when it comes to this kind of socialist experience that we're all immersed in. So part of what we're seeing with Illinois, I believe a large part of it has to do with this um, Agenda 21, Agenda 2030 rollout. Now, go back in time the United States did not raise the budget ceiling, and we're going to start to have a discussion about this here pretty shortly. I would say within the next three to four weeks, it's going to come up. Now, Obamacare looks like it's about to get derailed. To what to what degree it's going to be derailed? We're, you know, we're not sure. You now, Rand Paul is saying just just pull the plug on it right now, and we'll figure it out. That's going to be, you know, very difficult because a lot of people depend on this system that they set up. Now, Obamacare was created under a Mercury retrograde, but I knew it wasn't going to go into last. I talked about this on, I think it was on the Vinnie Eastwood show a long time ago. It was back in 2012 or 13, I think 2013. Vinnie Eastwood interviewed me, and I said Obamacare is going to fall because of where it was created or when it was signed into action astrologically. In fact, there is so much retrograde about the Obama administration in general. Um, it's going to be interesting to see how, how history views the Obama administration. And by the way, we still haven't uncovered the enigmatic source of 
Eric Holder's tweet. I mean, we know that Eric Holder tweeted, but what was he really tweeting the other night? We basically said, our good people at the DOJ and the FBI, get ready because you're going to be tested. We'll see that probably over the next uh, few days or week, or maybe it's just another one of these tweets at 3 a.m. that is designed to keep us awake and unsteady and unsure about where everything is headed. Well, I know where the majority of America is headed tomorrow, whether or not you are a full-fledged nationalist and you believe in the flag and you believe in the country and you believe that America is a great nation, and for all of its flaws, for all of its bullshit, it's the best in the world. It is the best model in the world. The problem is is that we suffer under the weight of our own morality. And our morality is our... It's our ball and chain in a lot of ways. I'm not saying to be immoral, but we can never live up. See, that's Neptune on the midheaven. In the chart, we can never as a country live up to the ideals and the precepts and the morality set forth. We're always going to fall. We're always going to be failed. We're always going to be human. But to the degree of which that happens, well, that's a whole other story. You know, we can make mistakes. We can make errors in judgment. That happens. But when we consciously fund and aid terrorists, people that are demonizing local cultures, people that are demonizing different faiths, such as Christians in Syria, then it becomes not just a black mark on our ability to uphold a moral standard that we can never really achieve, but it becomes something even worse. It becomes deceptive. And it becomes almost demonic in some ways. So if you believe in the greatness of the country, if you believe that the things that we stand for, which are different things in many people's minds, but if you believe in things like sovereignty, if you believe in self-determination, if you believe in the fact that if you will it, it shall be, if you believe in the fact that your expression of will backed by a commensurate amount of faith, not just in you, but in your fellow man and woman, and the divine spirit that guides all of us. If you have that, that's part of the American experience as well. If you can embody this energy that we share, a positivity a sense of hope, which has always been a part of this country. That's the Sagittarius Center. If you can, if you have those things inside of you and inside of your day-to-day experience as an American, when you're living the American dream and you're living the best parts of this country. And the other thing that we will have to address at some point down the road, and I'm, I'm pretty clear about this, is at some point... We're, and we've already begun the process. When Trump was elected as president, that was a big, big fat no. It was a big fat no to where things were going. We might have to have our own version of another big fat no. As we look around and say, look, this could be better. This could be better. And we're going to have to create that better, that new. It's going to be difficult for a number of different reasons. But it's not out of the question, not out of the realm of possibility. So, for 24 hours, for 24 hours, starting tomorrow, maybe today, maybe 48 hours, what would it feel like to be a good American? What would it feel like to be something that the rest of the world says, we like these people? And we like these people not because they've given us the Kardashians, not because they've given us the Big Mac. No, we like these people because they're self-determined. They understand the price of freedom. They understand what it takes to be able to work and determine their own path in life. Because that's really what it's about. And to not be engaged in some level of consent with a governing body that is consistently making choices for us. That's the crown. That's England all over again. Try it off for size. Find something you feel good about for 48 hours about being an American. If you're not an American, find at least one thing you love about us. 
And when it's your day, your time, your independence, we'll do the same for you. This is Robert Phoenix. You've been listening to 15 Minutes of Flame, clocking in at 44 minutes. Use your head to discern what's real, your heart to stay open to what's possible. I'll see you guys hopefully tomorrow on the day of days, America's birthday. Adios.